I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. Matthew chapter 17 and beginning with verse 1. And I want to speak to us by the Holy Spirit a summon and a direction, a commission of God to bring some clarity, a call, and some balance into what God is doing and the work of God in our midst. Because God always moves for a divine purpose. Everybody say that after me. Say, God always moves for a divine purpose. He doesn't move so we can become inward focused. I'm going to say that again. He doesn't move so that we become inward focused. They say the greatest time, and it shouldn't be this way, but they said the most productive times of churches are the first five years of their existence. Because in the first five years, most churches are moving so forward to build and to build a foundation that they're very engaged in outreach and ministering and touching other people's lives. But after five years, they begin to shift step by step, slowly become more and more inward focused so that at 15 years, most churches begin the death process. Hello. It's not supposed to be that way. Somebody say outward focus. But I want to show you that it's not enough just to be outward focused initially. Because we do see some groups, they start out with outward focus, but the problem is they don't have enough going on inward to do really that much good outward. Because you cannot give what you have not got. So let's look at this, Matthew chapter 17 and beginning with verse 1. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here <coughs> three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And when he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear them. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Can I drop a bomb in your spirit for a moment here? Come on. Oh, thank you for the three people that said amen. <laughs> Can I drop a bomb in your spirit right now? Amen. Can we smack the devil around a little bit now? Amen. Now, listen, I love the love of God. I want you to experience the love of God. I want you to have encounters with the love of God. But I think one of the reasons why we have failed so miserably in, the, in, in effective evangelism is that we keep talking to people about his love, and we need to understand his love, and we keep talking about his love and bringing people who want to come and experience his love, and they absolutely do, and I'm not minimizing that. But will you please tell me one place in this Bible where God ever revealed himself that the first thing out of their mouth was, oh, he's so lovely. Hello. They were afraid. They cried out, I'm undone. They cried out, Lord, I'm a sinner. They repented because when there's a real revelation of God, there's a revelation not only of his love, there's a revelation of his holiness. And what we're trying to do is win people over, not with even agape love, which is not even an emotional thing, but with the warm fuzzies of a feel-good, positive environment, instead of allowing God to come in and penetrate the darkness that's in their lives, to move them to a place of true repentance, so they truly have an encounter with God that changes them forever. Come on. Come on. Hello. Come on. Somebody say the devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. The devil, you're a liar. And so we've got to begin to have experiences and encounters with the glory of God. If someone says they had an encounter with the glory of God and they're still living in horrible, wicked sin, they're lying to you. So here Jesus, I ain't going to hold back tonight. <laughs> Come on. Here Jesus, look, he called Peter, James, and John to go up to the mountain to see his glory. Now, I want to put a couple things in your spirit because somebody's going to have to climb the mountain to get to the glory. I'm going to say it again. Somebody, and I preached this, and part of this a number of months ago, but just get in your spirit. You're going to, it's good for you to hear it again. 
Somebody's going to have to climb the mountain to see to get to the glory. And in order for Peter, James, and John, I wanted you to put this in your spirit. Let me hit it quickly so I can get where the other part I need to get to. But in order for Peter, James, and John to get up to the mountain to have this encounter with the glory, can you imagine what it was like? Jesus' body was changed. His garments became white. He shone like the sun. This is not your average day at church. Come on. But in order for them to get to the place where they had this life-changing encounter, they had to leave something behind. The first thing is they had to leave the multitude. They had to leave the masses. They even had to leave the committed. So let's start with this. Let me put it in order. First, the masses. Everybody say the masses. How many know there's the masses of humanity out there? But if you're going to go into a place of having an encounter with God and the glory of God, you are going to have to start separating yourself for at least a season. You're going to have to separate yourself, and don't get me wrong. I'm going to show you how we go back to them. But you're going to have to separate yourself from the masses. See, the masses are out there. They're living like the devil, living like the world. And some people say, oh, they, they're they saying, no, okay, I get saved, and so now I'm going to go run to the masses to witness to the masses. But the problem is they never separated themselves unto the glory first. And so they go to the masses, and so they act like the masses and talk like the masses and try, and try to integrate with the masses to prove that we Christians are just normal people. There's nothing normal about you if you're a Christian. Oh, we're just like everybody else. What? Sinners on our way to hell? That's not the message we're supposed to send to them. Come on, somebody. Amen. Come on. How many of you are like me? How many of you are bound into drugs, bound into alcohol, bound into all kinds of sin? When Jesus came and set you free, he didn't leave you the way you were. He required a transformation. In fact, one of the reasons why when I see young people that, uh, especially young people that like to hang out on the streets all the time and, you know, do cruises and all that kind of stuff and they get saved, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen churches do is they immediately get them up and within a few weeks they want to get them back out there witnessing. Yeah, yeah, you put them back out there. I have found that if you put them back out there, usually within a year, they're usually going to backslide. Why? Because there's still too much of the love of those things and too much of familiarization with the spiritual atmosphere that it seduces them back. Oh, I'm in so much trouble right now. See, Jesus turned to Peter, James, and John. He said, I am, I'm pulling you aside. Now, why only the three of them? Don't you think he wanted to take the 12? Don't you think he would have wanted the, the multitude to see him and in his glory? But there was only three that were ready to do the level of separation in order to have an encounter with his glory. Someone say, I'm going to have to separate myself from the masses. you got to separate yourself from the masses, but also even the multitude. Now, the multitude, they're the ones that go to church on Sunday. How many know there's a lot of, and, and in the multitude, you got a mix of people that are saved and people that are not saved. Hello. Come on, our churches. Billy Graham says this, 80% on any given Sunday morning, 80% of the people going to church are probably not truly born again. We got a lot of people that hang out. It's very easy in the American church to hang out and be a non-Christian and go to church and punch a spiritual time clock because in most of our churches, I'm not trying to be critical, just real. In most of our churches, there's so little conviction. Yeah, exactly. They're majoring on comfort and not conviction, trying to keep you as comfortable as possible and hope it will kind of by osmosis, you'll just kind of transfer in. But no, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How they can they be saved except someone preach the word? Woo! Why are we afraid of the word? Why are we afraid of the boldness of the word? Why are we afraid of the confrontation of the word? I want God to penetrate and confront every bit of wickedness in my life so I can repent and I can get right. Amen. Someone say the devil's a liar. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know we're in the Bible Belt here, and I know I'm going to get in trouble right for now. I know we're in the Bible Belt here, and I know we're in, I know we're in a, an indoctrinated area that people say, well, God pre-chose you before you were born, whether you're going to be saved. And if you're going to be saved, then you're going to be saved. And if you're not going to be saved, then you won't be saved. And so there, there, there's no real thing. I'm sorry. I do not find that scriptural at all. 
Why would God ever warn us to not to be careful and say that, well, um, let me show you something. Someone's karamo Sunday. I'm not trying to get doctrinal, but I'm going to get doctrinal. Come on, Hebrews chapter 6 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 6. Whoo. <laughs> Verse 4, beginning with verse 4. Hebrews chapter 6 and beginning with verse 4 says this. For it is impossible. Someone say impossible. impossible. For it is impossible for those who have once who were once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Now why in the world would it be included in the Bible that there's a possibility for people to fall away who have tasted of the heavenly gift if there wasn't a possibility for them to fall away? Now I want to give you a moment of comfort. I don't believe most Christians have tasted of the heavenly gift. I don't believe most Christians have tasted of the powers of the age to come. But I believe that God's bringing us into that place. But there is, hey, to him is given much, much is required. If you start tasting of the heavenly gift and you start tasting of the powers of the age to come, you better not try to walk away. Because we preach an, unpre an, an unpreached doctrine called the luxury of backsliding. We preach a doctrine that you could just, you come to God and backslide, come to God and backslide, it won't be any, it, it doesn't really matter. Hey, don't you dare trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. Shoo. If you're going to go to the glory, you're going to have to separate from your masses, you're going to have to separate yourself even from the multitude, and even the core. There's a core of people, man, they're in church all the time. They're going, they, 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 they serve and they're involved and, 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 they, and they genuinely love God, but they're not interested in paying the price to get to the glory. They're willing to only go so far. They, they maybe even love a dimension of the presence of God. They enjoy a good, strong word, but they're not willing to surrender and lay it all down. They still have maybe one foot around the world, or at least in the comforts and the distractions of this day, that they're not willing to pay the price and go through the cost of climbing the mountain to get to the place where they see him face to face. Somebody say, somebody, somebody. has got to go to the glory. Say it again. Somebody, Somebody has got to go to the glory. And don't you fool yourself. You can't be going to the glory on Sunday and looking at pornography on Monday. You can't be sitting there going to R-rated movies and listening to every kind of filth and garbage and being entertained by the very things that crucified Jesus to the cross and then think God's going to open up the heavenlies to you. You might be going to church and you might be feeling the overflow of somebody else's breakthrough. Come on. Come on. Huh? Yeah. Man, when they had encounters with God in the Bible, it was a transformation that took place. Someone say it permanent. permanent. Transformation. transformation. How weak do we think the blood of Jesus is? How weak do we think the born again experience is? That so many people can come. I got a little preach in me tonight. Is that all right? That's, how, how weak do we think it is that so many people can come to church, pray a little prayer, boo-hoo and cry and snot and spit a little bit, and then they 95% of them walk back out of the church, and a year later we never see them again. They never got born again. They had an emotional experience, but they didn't have a transformation. Huh? When I got saved, I got saved. Come on, when I got saved. Oh, come on, and I know some of you, when you got saved, when you finally got saved, some of you played in and out of church for a while, but then you had an experience where you truly got born again, and that was it. The line was drawn. You were never going back. I'm not saying you didn't have some things to overcome. I'm not saying you didn't have some things you battled through. But every time you fell, every time you came overcome by temptation, you were broken before God. You were falling on your knees. You were running back to the throne because now your life is to live for him. But not everybody's willing to go to the glory. In fact, the majority of people are not. They're not willing to pay the price and pray the price. It's too easy to be a comfortable, common Christian in America. 
We don't live under persecution. We don't live in that, that, those environments. And I thank God for that. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not volunteering for, for, for persecution. I do tell people all the time I'm not afraid of death. I'm not. I'm, I'm not afraid to be killed for the gospel. Now, torture is a different story. <laughs> Don't be pulling my toenails out or nothing, all right? <laughs> Man, if they came up to torture me, I think I'd preach extra hard just so they'd kill me. Oh, don't look at me so spiritual. Y'all know. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Somebody's got to, we, we got to get to the glory. Everybody say get to the glory. Get to the glory. But, but, and that's where we're impressing. Oh, what encounters we've been having this summer. Amen. Yeah. What an awesome, incredible touch of God. Those of you have been coming. Oh, the last few Fridays have been utterly amazing. Yeah. God having breakthroughs. Uh, but Amen. then, then, then we got a little problem. We got a Peter problem. Once the glory shows up, <clears throat> we want to stay there. Once we have a new fresh, a new fresh touch, a new fresh breakthrough, and I'm not claiming like what we've gone is the real fullness of the manifestation glory of God, not even close. But you are having greater experiences, amen? amen. But the, he went up the mountain and then Peter, let me say Peter. Then Peter, verse 4, then Peter, in, in, in Matthew 17, verse 4, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You know what? He's right. It is good for you to be in encounter with the glory of God. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And this is the problem with most revival churches and most churches that have a move of God. The moment the move of God hits, everybody wants to camp out. Let's hang out here and stay here for the rest of our lives. They don't say it quite that way. They say it this way. This is the end time move of God. I remember when the, when the move of God hit Toronto. And I don't care what, uh, what I, you know, some people say, you know, well, I don't know, I don't believe in that holy laughter movement. It was a move of God. It was a move of God. There was a, you say, well, what was the, what's the purpose of all that holy laughter? There were some depressed Christians. They needed some joy. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw what it did overseas, especially. It swept, in England, it swept through the Anglican churches. I mean, I mean churches that they, they were religious. They had no semblance of Jesus. Next thing you know, God starts blowing in. And these people are rolling on the floor and having holy laughter, giving encounters with God, falling in love with Jesus. It was a move of God. Amen. But the problem is then people wanted to hang out there. Let's build a tent. Come on. Let's hang out here. Woo, let's stay here. This is it. We're, forget everybody. Now think of it. They just left the ma ma masses. They just left the multitude. They just left the core. They get up there. They see the glory of God, and Peter is willing to forget about them all. He needed to separate himself from them to get to the glory, but he was not supposed to get to the glory so he could forget about them. And so often that's exactly what happens in the church. We do start getting a little bit committed towards God. We do start getting a little radical toward God. Then we go in there and we start having encounters with God. And next thing you know, we want to hang out and soak all week long. Oh, let's just soak with Jesus. Let's just soak. Oh, let's just hang out. Oh, and you get a little pocket of a little, a, a little clique of Christian uh, charismaniacs that just want to spend all day praying for each other and prophesying over each other and ministering to each other and getting in touch with each other and rolling on the ground and laughing and having a good time. And they done forgot about the core. They forgot about the committed. They forgot about the ma multitude. They forgot about the masses. Yes. They can walk by him all day long and not even be burdened by him anymore because they're too busy going, Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. and then we, we cater to it. We cater to it here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. You. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're not prostituting the anointing. Because you, you got conferences going on and meetings going on, and we're inviting everybody, come, come, come. Come have an intimate time with us, but you don't need to be committed to anything. 
So you can, oh my, I'm in, I'm in so much trouble right now. You can hop, right, you can hop in this in Dallas Fort Worth. You can go from conference to conference to conference and special meeting, special meeting, 52 weeks a year. You can go in and I, I know people that that's all they do. Go from place to place to get another touch, to get another feeding, to get another touch, to get another feeding. And they didn't realize it became all about them. God never intended to release these breakthroughs. He never intended to release these anointings. He never intended on releasing these touches that you're having so that you could sit there and just build a little tent and swallow you and hang you out with your Peter and your James and your John and your Jesus and your Moses and Elijah and just sit there and have a glory time for the next five years. The moment they had the glory encounter and God spoke to him and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Oh. <sighs> fell to the ground and then Jesus get up now think about it they just heard the audible voice of God they saw the visible Shekinah glory of God they saw Moses they saw Elijah and Jesus didn't even give them time to hang out in it he said you've done seen it now let's go go where go back down the mountain because somebody's got to learn how to go to the glory and then immediately turn around and go back down the mountain And bring the glory with them. Someone say bring the glory. Bring the glory. Isaiah chapter 58 beginning with verse 1. Whew. Ah. Thank you. I've got 20 bucks for you here. Right <laughs> i got to buy my crowd. Now, Isaiah chapter 58, we know this is the, as, the, as the fasting chapter, and, but I want, I want us to get a breakthrough here tonight. Now, I, I might be funnier tomorrow night, but I'm not in a funny mood tonight. Amen. Somebody say, we got to go down the mountain. We gotta go down the mountain. See, God spoke to me when this move was starting this summer, when things started breaking out in June, and he said, dedicate the summer as a summer of revival. He spoke to me, and I began to declare, the very first week I began to declare, we're going to go till the end of the summer, and then we are focusing outward. We're going to have a time where we come together. We go up to the mountain. We're going to have a time where we have encounters with God. A time where God begins to set us free and do amazing, wonderful things in our lives. But then we are immediately. Everybody say immediately. immediately. Say it again. Say immediately. immediately. He didn't let them. I mean, they just finished falling to the ground. He said, get up. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Okay, so this is going to be heavy. Everything's going to be heavy. Okay, he says, he says, you do it and you do it loud. <laughs> Tell my people their trans... The Lord loves you. He has the best plan for you. He just, you, 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 you were born to win. And it's only all those terrible people that told you you couldn't do it, that robbed it from you. You weren't born to win. You were born in sin. And until you got born again. He said, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a, and tell my people their blessings. Watch this. Watch. You're going to see who I'm talking about here. Because that's what we want to hear. We want to hear the blessing. We want to go to see the latest prophet that can come along and, and prophesy over us how blessed we're going to be. Come on, we line them up like the Christian Psychic Network. Come on, amen. You can, you can even do that now. Do you know you can pay $3,000 to this whack job? I won't even mention his name, but he calls himself a master prophet. What's a master prophet? <laughs> and then you can, you can spend $3,000 and get your own personal profit for one year. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ooh, Lord. <laughs> Tell my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. Yet, now here he's, these are the people he's going to rebuke, okay? These are the people he's talking to. Yet they seek me daily. So these are not the non-seekers. These are people that are seeking God daily. 
Uh oh. And watch this. Wait. And delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteous and did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Wait, 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 wait. These are not these just a Sunday going church people. These are, the, these are committed people. Come on, let me read that to you again. And don't, don't put it up there. Just, I'm going to read it out. First off, they seek me daily. So these are people who have a daily prayer life. They delight to know my ways. These are people that genuinely are saying, God, we want to know your ways as a nation that did righteous. And they do not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask of me ordinances of justice and take delight in approaching God. They love to go to church. They love to worship. They love the word. Uh oh. Come on, come on. Huh. See, God, God here is talking about, the prophetically he speaks to us, he's talking about the church, specifically the on fire church. They are prayer warriors, they love the word, and, they, and, and they're worshipers. Yet God still has a bone to pick with them. Verse 3, they say, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. <laughs> he said, the reason you're, you take delight in seeking me, but you're seeking me for your own benefit. <sighs> you're seeking me for your pleasure. <laughs> you are, I'm going to, can I get in a little more trouble here? <laughs> come on, come on. You're seeking me just so you can get a goose bump and a jerk and a jiggle. Oh, my goodness, it's quiet now. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to get heavy now. <laughs> you're, you're seeking me for your person, pre predominantly for your personal benefit. You're fasting, you're praying, you're crying out, and you're saying, but Lord, why hasn't it gone deeper? Why haven't we had a greater breakthrough? Why am I not experiencing the abundance? Why am I not experiencing the level that, that is being talked about, God? I'm seeking you, I'm going after you. And the Lord says, because you're predominantly going after me for yourself. You still are so wrapped up in yourself. You're wrapped up in getting your touch. And then he says, whoa, oh, whoa, my God. I And you exploit all your laborers. <laughs> Who are the laborers? The laborers are the ones that were doing the work so that you could receive something. So you come in. I'm in so much trouble right now. Turn to neighbor and say, he's in trouble now. So you come. <laughs> oh, Lord, Jesus. That back door is open, right? <laughs> So you come so you can receive a touch and you use those that are here, that are working, that are serving. You exploit the laborers because you're not coming so you can get to the glory and go back down to the multitude. You're predominantly coming so you can get a touch and you'll use the pastor and you'll use the preachers and you'll use the, you, the, the worship team and you'll use the nursery workers and you'll use the children's workers so you can get yours. You know how many times people show up in the churches and they've got young children and they drop them off in the nursery and that's great, but they won't serve one day in the nursery because they got to get their blessing. You're these people that God's talking about. There's a lot of people that have pie, my Sunday. They bounce from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. And when offering time comes, they drop a dollar or five dollars in there. They put ten times that much money just getting their family to there and feeding themselves, stuffing their faces at a restaurant afterwards, but they don't see any problem with it because I'm going to go get my blessing because it's all about my pleasure. And so they exact the laborers. They exploit the laborers. They pull on the laborers. I got to get mine. I got to get mine. I got to get mine. Now I'm in so much trouble right now, but that's all right. That's why we got people that hop from church to church to church just to get their little blessing. There's people today, they, George Bonner says this, they say the, day, the days come where a large percentage of the Christian population have more than one home church because they go and they look on the menu to see who's got the best thing that day. 
They're exploiting the laborers. They're using the church to get what they want. Wow. <laughs> that, Prophet Steve, you might have to rescue me here in a minute. Huh? Think about it. We use. We use. Because it's still about my comfort. It's still about what I want. And here the problem is in the church is we've created an environment for that to exist. We make everything as easy as possible. Man, I mean, I'm telling you, you walk into some of these churches, and I'm not trying to be critical, but we've just, we've catered to this thing. You walk into some of these churches, man, I mean, I mean they practically just bring you in your own little private cart right up to your seat, you know? Can, 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 you know? Oh, let's brush that seat off for you and let you sit down. Would you like a latte? We actually invite them, come and use us for your pleasure. And God is saying, cry aloud, spare not, lift up a voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression. Verse 4, I've got to move on. Everybody say amen. amen. <clears throat> it gets nicer down the road here. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. To strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. You say, what do you mean that? Well, that's another element. We run, we get caught up and we run to our little select groups that preach what we want to preach so we can reinforce our doctrine so we can kind of, cut. oh my goodness. You know, I've had many people I've had come in this church, and, and when we first started, it was amazing. People came in here and said, oh, praise God, we love the anointing, Pastor Steve, it's amazing, and we're just looking for the day when God gives you the revelation that we need to have church on the Sabbath. <laughs> because we won't experience the glory, so we start doing it on the Sabbath until we start doing the Jewish feast. You know, if you want to practice that, that's between you and God. Bless you. The Bible says if you think one day is more important than another, that's fine. But the Bible also says for those of us who think that every day is equal, it's okay too. Uh-oh. But no, we get around and run around to our little groups to get to reinforce what we already believe. And so we, we get on our so we can, so, so we are for fasting and praying. Have you ever noticed that there's groups that start claiming having a move of God and the first thing they want to do is debate with everybody else why they're wrong? And we're saying, why haven't you answered? What we're really saying is, God, why haven't you changed our city? Because you're coming together to get your own pleasure, because you're using the laborers to, get, to feed yourself, and because you're so busy fighting over nothing doctrines. Come on. Come on. Am I talking to anybody Come here tonight? Maybe. Come on. Come on. Huh? See, pride comes in. These people love the presence of God, but they despise the cross of God. They want to hang around the presence, but they don't want to die. They want to feel the glory. They want to see the miracles. They want to hear a word. They want to get excited and jump and shout. They want, they want to worship passionately, but they don't want to die to themselves. Right, it's still all about me. They come year in and year out and still licking their wounds. I'm in so much trouble here. Why? Because as long as it's still about you, you'll never truly get healed up from your wounds. The Bible says, pray ye one for another, and you shall be healed. It didn't say go through five years of counseling. Oh, I'm in so much trouble here. Come on. You want to get healed of your wounds? Get your eyes off yourself. Get a hold of the cross. Die to yourself. Oh, but Brother Steve, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You don't want to do it. And so you come, and they keep coming. Use the church. Use the church. Use the laborers. Use the presence. Use it to try to feed themselves, feed themselves. And God says, hey, you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Verse 5, is, this, is it a fast I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow his head like a bulrush and to spread out like sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Verse 6, is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, not off your life, off of somebody else's? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 
He said, I brought you together and I gave you a touch so you would begin to seek my face to get somebody else delivered. To get somebody else set free. Come on, amen. Someone say, the devil's a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. God didn't save you just so you could enjoy a Christian experience. If that's all you were going to have, he would have taken you home the day you got saved. He saved you so you could go into the spiritual warfare prayer. You could break down some strongholds and get somebody else free. Huh? It's an offense to the cross when we can have people get saved and never lead anybody to Jesus. Oh, Brother Steve, don't put that heavy on me. I didn't. Jesus did. Huh? Never even witness, never even tell. The boy, we, woo, we have a good time in church. Turn to neighbor and say, is he talking about you? <laughs> to loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. <laughs> To undo the heavy burdens. To undo the heavy burdens off of somebody else. 90% of every pastor, I'm going I'm to help the pastor. I wish I had a pastor's conference right now because I'd be preaching to pastors this. 90% of every pastor, 90% of pastors who start a ministry, full-time ministry in their 20s, never make it to retirement. They get burnt out. You know why? Because, and I'm just going to be honest, the people suck the life out of them. Heavy burdens. They come just putting them on, putting them on, putting them on. Demand this, demand that, demand. I had a pastor friend of mine, precious, dear man of God. He got a phone call one time. He gets up at 4.30 every single morning. Guy was a, a, just a revivalist. I mean, an amazing man of God. He, he slaughtered the English language. Good old boy from backwoods of Georgia. He preached about a modern day, modern day phenomenon. and those homosexuals and lesbians. <laughs> but I'm telling you, man, miracles that happen, words of knowledge would flow. He got a phone call, two o'clock in the morning, Brother Walden, he's going to be with Jesus now. Brother Walden, yes, yes, sister, yes, sister. I just had to call you and give you a testimony. All right. Remember you prayed for me last week because I was all constipated? <laughs> yes. Well, I just had a bowel movement. It couldn't wait till 4.30. Huh? To undo the heavy burdens off of the leadership, off of those that are served. The Bible says, 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 obey them and have rule of you and don't make it a burden for them. Don't make it a burden for them. But also the heavy burdens off of other people. Stop piling things on everybody else. Amen. Come on, amen. amen. To let the oppressed go free. To let the oppressed go free. Amen. Oh my goodness. And that you break every yoke. Every say every yoke. Say it again. Say every yoke. Every yoke. Break every yoke. See, God gives us these encounters so we can do something with it. He gives us these encounters so we can walk in the anointing because the anointing is what breaks every yoke. Yeah, that's right. So why are, you, why are you fasting? Why did I have you fasting? So you would have an anointing to break the yokes of bondages off of somebody else. I didn't ask you to come and listen, see, if we'll start taking care of him, he'll take care of us. He says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Well, seeking first the kingdom of God, we still take that as an inward thing. No, we're seeking first that the kingdom is being built. And the only way the kingdom is being built is for souls to get saved and lives to be changed and transformed. Come on, amen. amen. So seek ye first the kingdom. What is God? He, what did he 
Jesus came for this purpose the Son of God was made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Build the kingdom. You got to touch, take what you got and give it to somebody else. Now watch this. Verse 7. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? (laughs) Your bread. Your revelation. Is it not you to share your revelation, the word, with the hungry? This is why, this is the fast that I'm going to honor. This is those, this is when you seek me and come after me, this is what's going to delight me. When you seek me and you come after me and you receive something from me and you go and you share it with the hungry. And when I say the hungry, the hungry there, it, 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 the implication is there is those that lack food. Not a bunch of overstuffed Christians that spend all their time eating at the buffet of Revelation. but those who don't have it in the highways, in the byways, out in the jobs, out in the gym, out in your school, out in your neighborhood, that you begin to share the revelation. You begin to share the bread of life, Jesus, and the revelation of Jesus with the hungry. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus, but they're hungry. They don't even know what they're hungry for, but they're hungry. Come on, somebody. They're looking for something. They're starving for something, and they need some bread, some heavenly bread. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are outcast? Oh, Ramasha, Karama Sunday. You bring to your house. Could this possibly be not just yes, into your home, but could this also possibly be into our churches that you bring to the house of God the poor, not just the naturally poor, but the spiritually poor and the emotionally poor and those that nobody wants to care about and those, those that nobody really wants to see and those that might smell a little funny is this not God says what's going to excite me is this not why I called you to fast is this not why I called you to pray is this not why I gave you this glory so you could go find the wretched and the poor and the hungry and bring them into my house Sunday. the poor who are cast out here Shikaramo Sunday, Shakaramo Sunday. Why have we spent so much time trying to, oh Lord, help me, cater church, cater church to those that are acceptable? Oh my goodness. I wasn't acceptable, but I'm now accepted in the beloved. Come on, amen. We got to stop when we see those that are so far away from God. We got to stop having that knee jerk reaction of, ooh, I want to get away from them, to, oh man, I want to bring them something. Huh? It's so easy that we get so sanitized in our Christianity that we become offended with the, with the very thing that we used to be that we want to hide in our little spiritual community and we want to, again, it's all about our comfort and our pleasure, but we don't want to go out there and get out there because we're afraid of getting dirty. No, why don't you get to the glory and bring some glory down and let the glory transform them. Huh. And when you see the naked, that you cover him. Huh. (laughs) <laughs> when you see the naked, when's the first time naked appears in the Bible? When Adam and Eve had just sinned. When you see those who their sin is exposed, go scream and yell and point a finger of accusation at them. No, go cover them. My God. Are you, come on, anybody? Come on. Run up to them. Cover them. Bring them bread. 
bring them into your house. Bring the restoration power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. Oh my. Father, I give you praise. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. Lord, help me. Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. And Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to a place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and I. Ever say between Bethel and I? to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham, Abram called on the name of the Lord. The place between Bethel and I is where Abram, the father of our faith, the father of the covenant. <clears throat> the law of first mention applies here for this is the first one when God gave the covenant and that through that covenant, the blessing to the seed, Jesus Christ, has come to us. He first set up the altar, and in this altar is where he called upon the name of the Lord. It was between the towns of Bethel and I. Now, names mean something in the Bible. The name Bethel means the house of God the house of God. It is where the glory appeared. Let me say where the glory appeared. The house of God. The place where the glory appeared. But I means a heap of ruin. And he said, Abraham set up the altar where he called upon the name of God between the house of God and the heap of ruin. Somebody has got to set up. The church was always destined by God to be the divine connection place between the house of God, the temple of God, and those that are living their lives in ruin. Yeah. And in the place, not hanging out at Bethel, and not hanging out at I, but being in between, connecting the two, is where the church is supposed to be. Where we're connected to the glory of God, but we're also reaching out to the heap of ruin, and we are the place where those that are in ruin can come and touch the glory of God. You are, someone say, I am. You are that altar of God. You are that place because wherever you are, when you're standing between the house of God and the heap of ruin, there you can call upon the name of the Lord and God will answer because God longs to use you to bring his glory to a lost and dying and ruined generation. Someone say the house of God. And the heap of ruin. That's where we're to be. Shakaramo Sunday. When you do this, let's go back to Isaiah 50, 58, beginning with verse 8. Now God has rebuked him and said, this is what you're supposed to do. Then he says, watch the promise of God, Robert, if you'll come. Then, verse 8, your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing, your healing. Then your healing. When you get off yourself. When you stop just trying to get your blessing and your pleasure and just trying to get your breakthrough. When you stop saying, God, well, when I get my breakthrough, then I'll minister. He said, no, you come after me and you go after and you care about the lost and you bring what I've given you to them and watch what I'll do for you. Huh? You're wounded? Get out there and minister to somebody. You got disappointed? Go lay your life down for somebody else. Huh? 
Do you know how many Christians in Dallas, Fort Worth, in the Pentecostal spirit-filled churches are not even going to church because they're hiding in their homes, licking their wounds because they got hurt in the church. They had some disappointment or there's some little scar or some little thing. That's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to get out there and begin to minister and lay their lives down and love on one another and fast and pray for somebody else to get a breakthrough. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Oh, my God, do you know what he just said? If you get focused about out there, I'll stand behind. I'll protect your family. I'll protect your finances. I'll protect your physical body. I will be my glory. We'll protect your backside. Stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. Get a hold of my glory and take it to a lost and dying generation. Oh, shakara ma Sunday. Somebody give God a shout of praise. Shakara ma Sunday, ma Sunday. Huh? Then you shall call on the name. Turn me up. Then you shall call, verse 9, and the Lord will answer. You want to get to the place where every one of your prayers are answered? Get your eye off yourself. Every time you receive something from God, be focused and bent on bringing it to somebody that doesn't have it. God says, then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, here am I. Oh my God, we've been wondering why, Lord, why aren't you answering this prayer? Why aren't you touching our city? Why aren't you bringing revival? Why aren't you this? Why aren't you that? He says, that's because my people have been, the ones that have been seeking me, have been doing it so much for their own pleasure, their own self, their own benefits. They've been so focused on themselves. They've been dividing themselves from one another. But when they begin to lay that down and begin to pour themselves out for the hungry, for the poor, for the lost, for the broken, for the destitute, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I will say, here am I. What is it that you need? Oh, shakara my Sunday. If you take away the yoke from your midst, watch this, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness. And your darkness, my God, your darkness, the darkness of Keller, Texas, the darkness of Fort Worth, the darkness of Dallas, the darkness of America. God says it's going to become so bright, it'll be like noonday. At noonday, there's no shadows. There's no darkness. Oh, my Father God. God says, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. The Lord, verse 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you will be like a well-watered garden and like a spring of water, ready? Whose waters do not fail. God says if you focus outward, you'll 